Hello. There are a lot of things humans are smart enough to understand. But yet, there are some that we just simply can't or maybe shouldn't. To think that human beings as a race have evolved from cavemen and hunter-gatherer societies to exploring the cosmos and beyond. It's a wonder as to what the true limits of human potential are. With every decade, and nowadays every passing day it seems, it's as though we are destined to continuously gain knowledge and skills that our forefathers could only dream of. And yet there are still things that escape our needy grasp and hunger for understanding, and they just might possibly be for the rest of time. So, because I'm worried that this video might be very long, and also because I know that you didn't come here to listen to an intro, I am not a scientist, I am not a physicist, I do not have a degree in any of the topics covered in this video. That is a warning. And I do not plan on it after trying to summarize these things that humans can't comprehend. So without further ado, here is the incomprehensible slash unexplainable subjects iceberg. Above the iceberg. Pigeon homing. Pigeons that are specifically trained and raised to be homing pigeons have an otherworldly ability to find their way back to their base. If you were to take a bred homing pigeon and set its base somewhere in England and take it to Germany, let's say, there's a high chance that the pigeon will be able to make its way back perfectly fine to the base in England. And these birds aren't slow either. With an average speed of over 60 miles per hour, homing pigeons are specifically trained and bred birds with an uncanny ability to find their way back home, even if it's not on purpose. There's a story of a homing pigeon being bought and shipped to Sri Lanka, only for it to be released and to fly back to its home in Germany. Allegedly, the longest ever journey of a homing pigeon is of it being released in Aris, France, and it was able to make its all the way to Saigon, Vietnam in 1931. That's 7,200 miles in 24 days, by the way. But we know these birds are great at their job, and without going into it why there are such a high amount of them in older larger cities, it was their job to get home. But how do these birds work? Of course they have to be bred and trained to return home by ensuring that the birds have incentive to return to their home base with food or some other offering. But aside from taking them further and further distances from a young age, we can't nail down how they're able to make these incredible treks across the lands. There are three main theories as to the navigation of these birds. True navigation, magnetic orientation, and olfactory navigation. But none of these seem to nail down how homing pigeons really work. True navigation is the ability to see and use familiar areas like landmarks and roads when flying, and use that information to guide themselves back home. But this doesn't explain how homing pigeons are able to find their way home over large distances, especially over areas where they haven't flown or been to before. Next is magnetic orientation, which is the ability to use Earth's magnetic field to find their way home like a compass. Some scientists have even gone so far as to say that homing pigeons have iron particles in their beak to allow them to remain aligned with the north. Again, a problem arises though with this method, as a compass is no good without a map in human terms. Birds can't use maps, it's pretty simple. If these birds had a sense of north and no way of indicating which direction from north they should fly to return home, the compass is essentially useless. And finally, olfactory navigation. Olfactory navigation is using the sense of smell to hone in back to their path back home. With some scientists believing that this allows the birds the ability to orient themselves by learning the rough composition of atmospheric odors and their spatial disposition compared to winds that come from different directions to navigate. Do I know what that means? <laughs> no, I don't. I'm glad I wrote that. But that's the best that scientists have been able to come up with for these birds. Most believe that homing pigeons must use a mix of all of these to be able to get to their home base without an issue. But right now, scientists are still doing the introductory phases and steps in learning how these marvelous birds work and operate. And maybe soon, we'll be able to get our answer about these birds. Spontaneous combustion. Spontaneous combustion is the outbreak of fire without application of heat from an outside source. Most people have heard about the human variety of this phenomena, and while that's the wildest form and the most assessed form online of spontaneous combustion, there are quite a few other ways things just spontaneously ignite. Lots of things you might hope wouldn't catch fire in large quantities can be affected by spontaneous combustion. Cotton, coal, hay, and pistachios, to name a few. Hay and compost can self-ignite because of bacterial fermentation which causes oxidation, which in turn causes them to self-ignite. Pretty self-explanatory. Cotton can begin to combust at around 764 degrees Fahrenheit if the cotton degrades enough on a microbiological level. That's a word I didn't think I would have to ever say. Usually, this means the amount of cotton needs to be extremely high and contaminated by something like a paint, a varnish, or linseed oil like it was back in the day. 
If these conditions are met and there's a high enough quantity of cotton, the slow buildup of heat from self-heating to smoldering to open flame begins, thus leading to spontaneous combustion. Coal can spontaneously self-heat and self-ignite when a few conditions are met. The Titanic's coal was on fire. I just have to throw this out there. The Titanic's coal was on fire, quote, from the day they put out of Southampton until it hit the iceberg. That's how common it is. It's pretty common and scientists are still hammering out the details, but they've got it pretty much nailed down. Now here's the wild one. I just want to say this right now. Pistachios can spontaneously explode. Sorry, jumped over spontaneously combust there, but I thought I should just go straight to explode because if that's on the table, that's where we're going to go. And while yes, exploding and combusting is crazy, these nuts take in so much oxygen. <laughs> these nuts take in so much oxygen, even when picked that if you were in an enclosed room with a large enough amount of pistachios, you would suffocate, just as a thought. But aside from one of my new irrational fears, pistachios are very known for spontaneously combusting because of their fat content and taking in high amounts of oxygen. If the humidity and pressure is wrong or just right if you're on the side of the pistachios in the pistachio war, the nuts can break down fat and continue to take in oxygen while releasing carbon dioxide in a process that's more commonly known as burning or exploding. Yeah, this is one that is very well documented and easily understood on the chemistry level, but I couldn't not include pistachios. Humans, the one we're really here for. Spontaneous human combustion is as it sounds. The spontaneous combustion of a human being, alive or recently dead, without an external source of ignition. Most recorded cases of spontaneous human combustion, I will be calling it SHC going forward by the way, involve the affected having alcohol in some way or the other, as well as some parts of the leg or feet remaining intact. Humans have been recorded over the last 300 years to have spontaneously combust about 200 times. And while the chances aren't zero, they most certainly aren't enough to be that worried about it. Old theories on the subject relay back to the theory of humors in the body in an imbalance, which causes the affected to spontaneously combust. Or that the affected part took in alcohol, which rendered the body flammable. Neither of these work, though, as the first is a long disproven theory in the humoral theory of medicine. And the second wouldn't even be possible if the persons were possibly the most intoxicated a human could be, because it would still require a source of ignition. Most cases of alleged recorded SHC involve people that are older, or in some other form or the other having a limited form of mobility due to age or obesity. While most scientists nowadays think that SHC isn't possible at all and could all be an example of natural causes like someone falling asleep with a lit cigarette, there are a few speculated cases with nothing tacked down quite yet. Brian J. Ford offered up that ketosis could be a possible explanation as people that partake in low-carb diets or suffer from alcoholism allows the body to produce acetone, which is highly flammable and would lead to a spontaneous human combustion. A leading theory outside of unfortunate circumstances like cigarette sleeping is the wick effect. It's not the movie. Which is when a small external flame warms the clothing and causes human fat to melt into the clothing, acting as a reverse candle. Even the most fit of people will still have fat in their body. And like I said before, most cases of SHC involve people that are obese or can't move that much. So a buildup of fat is expected. There are other accounts and theories that I want to go over real quick, such as that SHC is caused by poltergeists and spirits needing a new host and entering or leaving the body, immolating it in the process. Some believe that eating or breathing in phosphorus in some capacity causes phosphine in the body, which is known to spontaneously combust on its own. And lastly, there's the theory that ball lightning is involved. What is ball lightning? Well, let me tell you. Ball lightning. Ball lightning is the rare phenomenon of a luminous sphere appearing usually near the ground during thunderstorms, measuring on average several centimeters in diameter. It has been associated with cloud-to-ground lightning, and while some have associated ball lightning with it, it is entirely distinct from St. Elmo's fire. The very descriptions and characteristics of ball lightning are some of the main reasons why it's hard to characterize or nail down at all, as ball lightning has been observed to be between pea-sized and up to a meter in diameter, as well as it being red, orange, yellow, white, or blue in color, and only lasts on average a few seconds. While ball lightning is usually not damaging or dangerous, it has appeared and shown to occasionally explode violently <laughs> or dissipate leaving behind the smell of burning sulfur or ozone in the area. This is why some people believe that ball lightning is the cause of occasional SHC, as it still has been shown to release heat after expulsion of the energy. Scientists, while proposing a number of hypotheses and being close to recreating what they believe to be an instance of ball lightning, have had a hard time replicating the data or finding substantial findings to classify ball lightning as its own distinct phenomenon to this day. 
Of these many theories and explanations, there are about 15 that have various scientific names and use of words that would require their own video or even icebergs to get into. This have ranged from air and gas behaving abnormally, vaporized silicon forming into a gas ball of energy to microwave radiation being trapped within a plasma bubble. If you want a deeper dive into ball lightning, you can go check out Joe Scott. He did an entire video on this topic three years ago that helps explain the concept without having roughly 30 other topics to cover in the same video. And speaking of the next topic, Great Sheep Panic. The Great Sheep Panic, or the Great Sheep Panic of 1888, if you like numbers, was an event that took place on November 3rd, 1888 in Oxfordshire, England. That involved tens of thousands of sheep over the course of 200 square miles, reportedly escaping their enclosures, going berserk, destroying property, and causing mayhem. And while yes, sheep are known for being sheepish and scaring easily, this amount of sheep in the tens of thousands at roughly the exact same time freaking out and panicking to the point that the farmer said that the sheep looked terror-stricken and were hiding in bushes, hedges, and crowding corners hasn't been able to be explained. Now, some have tried to explain this away as a case of ruffians or the uncultured youth scaring up the sheep. But the scale of this event was unprecedented and way too large for it all to have been done by the neighborhood kids. Another explanation was possibly some dog or fox happened to scare the sheep. But that still doesn't explain the fact that the sheep across counties were all scared simultaneously. The leading theory of the time, and most believe theory now, was that the event was caused by thunder and lightning in the area on the night of the Great Sheep Panic. This theory has its doubters, though, as lightning has pretty much happened everywhere, and has happened plenty of times before and after this, and while there are other cases of sheep panic in the area, none were quite to this level. And lastly, the more out there theories on the Great Sheep Panic were that there was either a meteoric blast or earthquake in the area which would have scared all the sheep. Or, on the night of the Great Sheep Panic, an unidentified large dark cloud touched the ground in the area of Oxfordshire and covered the sheep and people living in the area in such a pitch black darkness that this induced mass hysteria in the sheep. Neither of the latter two theories have had as much scientific backing, as there were no reported meteors or rumblings in the earth by anyone in the area. As well as this dark cloud phenomenon that is described doesn't fit any known type of cloud, or any as of yet known meteorological phenomenon at all. So to this day, there is still no definitive answer, and we truly may never know what the true cause of this great sheep panic was. The tip of the iceberg. ASASSN-VJ213939.3-7028161 that word, I can't and won't repeat all those letters and numbers, so I'm going to call it the Assassin Star because that sounds cool, is a name given to a star in our galaxy, among a few others that have had a very peculiar trait. It dims. That's it. No, I'm just kidding. While this has been shown before in other stars called variable stars, which is a star whose brightness changes with time, there are other stars like Tabby's star that shouldn't do this. The fact that a constant star in our galaxy began to show signs of dimming only for it to return to its original brightness is stunning to scientists. While stars do occasionally get brighter and darker, they can usually tell if that's caused by planets or exoplanets crossing in between the star and us, stardust, or binary stars that rotate each other. But a constant star shouldn't get dimmer and then return back to its original state of brightness, and scientists are having a very hard time figuring out why. There's another star very similar to this assassin star called Tabby's star that is dimmed and then returned back to its original brightness multiple times. But at sporadic intervals, there's no pattern to the madness yet. The best theories we have on why these stars are awkwardly dimming and then slowly returning to their original brightness ranges from these stars eating planets, to aliens creating megastructures to harness the power of their stars, such as with a Dyson Swarm. Maybe I should have put this deeper in the iceberg, or maybe I shouldn't have, you'll just have to see. Ashen Light Ashen Light is the theorized illuminating glow of the dark side of Venus. The theory that the dark side of Venus glows goes all the way back to the 17th century, when an Italian astronomer named Giovanni Riccioli saw what he reported to be a faintish gray light on the dark side of Venus that he dubbed the Ashen Light of Venus, hence why it's called the Ashen Light. There have been many reported sightings since over the next 300 plus years from many astronomers, but many more that haven't been able to see it. Such as Edward Emerson Barnard, who had observed Venus for over 18 years, weren't ever able to see this Ashen Light. All observations of Ashen Light are visual by the astronomers themselves, so there's no tangible proof that the phenomenon is even real. While there's still a select group of astronomers going back centuries that are quite sure and set on the fact that there is an odd glow to the dark side of Venus, as late as 2015, instances of occurrence of ashen light have had extremely suitable conditions to be recorded and planned, with still no concrete proof able to come out. 
The hardest part so far about any alleged sightings of ashen light is that it's never been recorded or photographed. The astronomy community has many theories about how this space light is even possible. The best, and most likely in no particular order, are massive lightning storms all happening simultaneously, causing a glow to form. It's possible that the light is caused by fireworks from the Venusians celebrating the ascension of their new emperor, and possibly it's being that it's just oxygen reaching a certain point in the atmosphere and emitting light. One thing is certain though, in the end, whether it's real or not, space has a lot of mysteries that we just simply can't or don't understand. I've left out about five or six different space-based unknowns that I am just not qualified to explain, let me just be honest. As well as I didn't want every other entry on this list to be about some far-off space thing that uses bigger words than I have any right using. For example, since the initial writing of this video, an entirely huge new way of seeing and exploring the universe was brought forward that could possibly change your outlook on not just space, but gravity and the galaxy itself, with the pulsar timing array. I am not even going to begin to act like I know the bare minimum to these but they are allowing scientists to see and observe space-time comprehensions, gravitational waves across the universe, and use pulsars to learn about the universe, which is giving us a deeper and more well-informed look on the universe. Hank Green put it in terms even I could understand in a tweet. Hank, at Hank Green, TLDR EL5 on pulsar timing arrays. Remember when the first telescope got made and then we spent 400 years continuously upgrading both the telescopes and our understanding of the universe? Well, that's happening again. We have a whole new universe detector. That is incredible and should in no way be understated, but we don't know right now what all it will or won't change our understanding or knowledge of. We just have to keep looking to the future and trying to understand more and more. Plague of Athens. The Plague of Athens was an outbreak of mysterious plague in 430 BCE, the second year of the Peloponnesian War that killed between a fourth and a third of the populations of Athens itself. The outbreak persisted for four years and no one knows what it exactly was. With the waging Peloponnesian War, the Athenians were a major maritime powerhouse against their almost entirely land-based opponents of Sparta. So when Sparta began a campaign on land, the Athenians, under the direction of Pericles, were forced to retreat into the city walls of Athens itself, while their navy was used to harass their Spartan troops. With Athens already being heavily populated, and an influx of soldiers from the war as well as refugees coming into the city, it resulted in overpopulation and even poorer hygiene standard than before that was a perfect breeding ground for disease. While we know that this plague existed, and that lots of people died from this outbreak, it oddly was limited to only the Athenians during the war, leading many to believe that biological warfare or possibly poisoned water supplies were to blame for this so-called plague. While we do indeed have a much sooner example of a sweeping illness killing close to one-third of a population, there are definitely parallels recorded between the plague of Athens and other historical plagues such as the Black Death. Many didn't care about Law and Order, not the television show and showed that many people ceased to care whether they lived or died, whether they had money or not, or the well-being of those around them. This is more widely attributed to a sense of borderland hysteria that seems to have fallen across many that lived through the time. The recorded symptoms of this mystery plague were recorded by one Thucydides, and if you have sympathy pains like I do, maybe skip these descriptions, which included violent heats in the head, a redness, and inflammation of the eyes. The throat and tongue would quickly become suffused with blood, Breath would become unnatural and fetid. Sneezing, hoarseness, violent coughing, vomiting, retching, violent convulsions, all while the body was extremely not so hot to the touch, nor yet pale. A livid color inkling to red, oh, and breaking out in pustules and ulcers. With all of these descriptions by Thucydides, who even reportedly by himself was afflicted by the plague of Athens, it's where the mystery truly arises. There are reportedly over 10 different speculated diseases and afflictions that could have befallen the people of Athens, and were only slightly better than we were centuries ago in determining exactly what it was. Originally, scientists and historians were quick to label this as another unfortunate example of the bubonic plague. But nowadays, with the previously mentioned descriptions of symptoms, that has been all but ruled out. Nowadays, the plague of Athens is attributed to anything from measles to typhus an ergot toxin, glanders, smallpox, an unknown bacterial infection, an unknown fungal poisoning, and more modernly, an Ebola-like virus. And yet the scientific and scholarly community has yet to accept any of these as the confirmed fatal disease. Weirdest yet of all is Thucydides himself, as there seems to be a lot lost in translation, as well as why he even included this outbreak in his book, as he wasn't a medical professional of any degree. So his reliability on symptoms has been called into question, a mass grave has recently been uncovered, though, in hope that DNA and RNA analysis and other modern technologies would finally be able to put this all to rest. 
It remains unlikely though, as viruses degrade quickly over time, making even modern analysis extremely unlikely in the end. The Haldenwell Incident The Haldenwell Incident was an incident, surprisingly. In 1980, in which hundreds of children began to suddenly collapse at an annual show held in a Nottinghamshire mining community. The event took place on the 13th of July, and was supposed to be a fun time for children to march in parades, get dressed up, and generally have fun. That's not what happened though. As buses showed up full of parents and their nervous children, things began to go bad quickly. Eyewitness accounts of the event say that sometime between 10.30 a.m. and 11.15 a.m., children began to collapse and faint. Some even recounting that it seemed contagious. Ambulances began to show up, and then more ambulances. So many in fact that one witness of the event pointed out to the BBC that, quote, One of the biggest frighteners was that many ambulances. People hadn't seen so many since the Second World War, end quote. Everything added to the panic from the parents looking for their children in the madness to police airing announcements over the PA system, which is why so many people explain this event away with mass hysteria. But there's more beneath the surface of this story. Children don't just pass out in the hundreds for no reason. Many reported symptoms of children's eyes and nose being red and sore, saying they don't feel well and can't sit up straight, some children even reporting white, frothy foam coming from their mouths. Some even recounted leaving the event early and reporting symptoms later, which isn't usual with mass hysteria, if you could guess. In the end, around 400 people, many of them children, were taken to the hospital and released that day, with a few being held overnight, including two babies. Of course, if it's in this list, there's a reason people don't quite understand why this happened at all. For the longest time, the official reasoning and ruling of what happened that July morning was ruled as mass hysteria. Their reasoning being that most children that happened to faint were wearing tight-fitting uniforms and hats, and were all concentrated in the top corner of the field. And the fact that the children didn't all faint at the same time, but instead were affected over the course of roughly two hours, added to the theory that this was a form of mass hysteria. Many, if not most people nowadays, believe this to be entirely false though, as stated before. People who left the scene were reported being affected two hours later. Many also were quick to point out that many of the children affected were from working class families and homes, so the inquiry wasn't taken seriously at all compared to that if it had higher class citizens. Of course, many theories have been thrown out as to possibly what could have been the culprit, including gas leaking from the underneath mine shafts. Remember, this took place in a mining community. To pesticides in the nearby fields, water and food poisoning were, of course, the paranormal. The leading theory these days is much more sinister, though. The initial report seems to point to a form of chemistry being at fault for the entire incident, and them going with mass hysteria instead, as it's more easily explained away without the need for a thorough investigation. Pesticides were sprayed three days before the event, which could possibly describe what happened, but is unlikely. The leading theory these days is a form of overcleaning of the toilets, which led to the creation of chlorine gas in the area, which possibly resulted in gas drifting across the fields and causing the incident. This, of course, is still a theory, and we may truly never know the true culprit, or if it was multiple things going wrong to create a bad scenario for all. But in the end, we can just be thankful that no one died, and there are now very rigorous safety conditions employed these days to help make sure another Hall and Will incident doesn't happen. Talapa Talapa is an unexplained glowing light phenomenon below the surface of the ocean that ancient and modern Polynesians used to navigate the Pacific. It's been described as a flash of bioluminescent light that emanates from a nearby island. So if you were to follow that direction the Talapa came from, you would be on your way to an island. There was a belief back in the day in the scientific community that Polynesians happened to colonize islands almost by accident. This has been disproven in plenty of ways, that the ancient Polynesians used to navigate the seas that have all been explained by some form or another, such as using stars, wind, wave patterns, the swells of the ocean itself, and the flight patterns of birds. But Telapa has remained unexplained all of these years later, and the mere existence of Telapa is looked down upon and unexplained by many modern scientists as a myth. A major reason for this is the fact that it has so rarely ever been seen, and especially not recorded or been able to be scientifically recreated at large. There are scientific research projects going on or being planned right now to hopefully help record Telapa so it can be proven and therefore studied. But in the meantime, this seems like a perfect time to finally go beneath the surface to the third layer of the iceberg. And now that we're actually beneath the surface part of the iceberg chart, I'd like to stop into the YouTube thing and ask you to subscribe, like, hit the bell, and also remind you to stay hydrated for the rest of our journey today. You haven't already? Just, just a thought. Beneath the surface. Naga fireballs. Naga fireballs are dazzling red glowing orbs that rise from the water at the Mekong River in late October or early November before they disappear. Hey. 
Locals have come to call the occurrence the Naga Dancing Fireballs, believing them to be supernatural and naming them after a giant sea creature that lives in the river called the Naga. These balls of light and fireballs wow the audiences and spectators who come in droves at the end of the Wanoka Fansa to celebrate the unexplained lights. If I said that correctly, thank you. If I didn't, I apologize. So far there is, as you could probably guess, no definitive explanation as to why these fireballs exist. And no one is sure when they started. While scientists still debate on what could cause these balls of light to rise and put on such a show at this specific river, many different speculations and explanations, not of the giant sea serpent variety, have been given that still don't seem to fit into the equation. A few different explanations of the event are possible. Buildups of swamp gas that spontaneously explode or ignite when it reaches air. With one Dr. Manos Kanak slip going so far as to say that the precise alignment of the Earth, Sun, Moon, and location of the Mekong River itself allows this exact occurrence to happen nowhere else on Earth but in Thailand. If that seems far-fetched, then maybe you're more inclined to believe that the river doesn't quite make this specific swamp gas, but instead it outputs phosphine, which causes the fireballs. The main detractor to that theory, though, is that phosphine is very unlikely to spontaneously ignite, and wouldn't stay lit while traveling at the speeds of these fireballs are reported to travel. There's of course the thought that it's not actually fireballs, but plasma orbs always has to be plasma involved, trust me, the further we go down this list somehow, that are formed when the river is hit with electricity, causing plasma balls to form, but no source of electricity has been found and there's no substantial evidence. And lastly, there are beliefs that the fireballs are actually tracer rounds and flares being fired from across the river to wow the audiences. This theory, though, was disproved in 2021 during lockdown when authorities came forward and stated that no gunfire or firing of flares were heard that night, hopefully putting that theory to rest. While the festival is reported to have ran for hundreds of years according to locals with only the name, and I'm going to butcher this, Fiat Nock Lights being about 35 years old, I hope that the event continues to awe for many more years and maybe, just maybe, somehow we'll see a Nog in the end. Sleep. We don't actually know why humans need to sleep. We just know that we do and what happens when we don't. And no, it's not the Russian sleep experiment or anything like that. While that might sound far-fetched, if you just go right now and look up why do humans need sleep on Google or your favorite search engine, you'll get very generic answers like it helps support healthy brain function and maintain your physical health. And while that is indeed very nice to hear, that isn't a conclusive answer. Biologically, we don't know why humans need to sleep still. While if you don't sleep, you can die. You probably wouldn't die outright from lack of sleep before some of the symptoms or sleep deprivation would kill you first in Minecraft. These symptoms usually begin with sleepiness, of course, irritability, trouble concentrating, headaches, and potentially paranoia and hallucinations. It takes rats 28 days to die of sleep deprivation. Don't ask me, I didn't do anything to those poor rats. And a man named Michael Cork died from lack of sleep after contracting fatal familial insomnia, an extremely rare prion disease that makes it impossible for a human to sleep. But why do we need sleep at all? There are animals on this planet that don't need sleep or sleep in very different ways, from bullfrogs that only need very minimal microsleeps, to animals that can turn off half their brain to sleep like the great frigate bird. But why do humans need sleep? There are about four major theories that scientists have come up with, and it may be an interconnection of multiple of them that leads us to finally understanding why we need to honk shoe. There's the energy conservation theory that posits that sleep is to reduce the amount of energy needed during parts of the day and nights when it's not needed for ideal hunting. There's the inactivity theory, which is the thought that if you don't go out at night where predators or injury could occur more commonly, you are more likely to survive, making it more beneficial for living creatures to sleep at night and pass that along to their ancestors. There is as well the restorative theory, which is essentially that the human body needs time for the body to repair and replace cells, and that their components that are needed for life run out during the day and must be replenished at night. And finally, there's the brain plasticity theory that states that sleep is necessary for the brain to reorganize, grow, and upkeep at night. While all of these theories are very prominent, they aren't all encompassing, and they're there more to state that we really just don't know why we need to sleep yet at a deep level. Just that we do. And that's kind of cool to me, and you'll see a lot more concept like that the deeper we go down this iceberg. And, speaking of, the placebo effect. The placebo effect is, according to the Australian government, no I don't live there, I just think they're cool, when a person's physical or mental health appears to improve after taking a placebo or dummy treatment. And before I even begin to get into this topic, I want to let you know that I want to do a deeper dive on this topic alone, as resources and stories I've read about the placebo effect are wild. So be sure to subscribe to see when that comes out. But in the meantime, let me give you a quick rundown. We aren't really sure whether the placebo effect is even real, to be honest. 
with many doctors and unknowingly patients swearing by it. There was a review of clinical trials in the early to mid-1900s that looked over how helpful or harmful placebos actually were. And the magic number that is still stated today is that 35% of people treated with placebos were treated with placebo alone. And while that alone is crazy, the effects of placebo with medicine seem to very much help, if not be a major factor in treatment. But those statements have come under much scrutiny over the years, as in the 1990s, I'm gonna butcher this name just as a heads up, Danish medical researchers Asbjörben, Hjörbjartsen, and Peter Gottschek, I will not be repeating their full names and will be calling them Peter and Asborn from now on, did a widespread look at the account of placebo, and what they did or didn't do. And their results showed that over the course of 234 trials investigating 60 different clinical conditions that the placebo effect doesn't really exist. This, though, is where just the beginning of the juiciness begins. Peter, not so much as Bjorn this time, was expelled from the board of the Cochrane Collective for being disruptive and undermining the work of the organization as a whole and what they stood for, especially in terms of meta-analysis and the Collective's work. The results of many studies have been shown that the effect could be explained with patients possibly wanting to show that things have improved to the people in coats and that could influence it, as well as many other things like chemistry, like I'm not going to get into this, but just just so you know, placebo has been proven almost in certain areas to be as strong as morphine. That's all I want to say. I swear I'll be back to this topic, and I'll discuss how in some studies placebo has been shown to be as strong as morphine. I just said that when saline was administered as a replacement and simultaneously stopped when a morphine-stopping drug was induced. It is so cool, but for now I need to stop or I will literally be here all night. Fairy circles not to be confused with the entirely different phenomena of fairy rings, which are rings of mushrooms that fairies live in, sadly not real. Fairy circles are areas in Africa and Australia where a circle of land is entirely barren of vegetation and is usually surrounded by a ring of heavier grass growth along its edges. These grassless areas in the area around them have been recorded for close to 100 years, and we are just now starting to get closer to find out how or why they even exist. They, until just recently, were only recorded to have been in the Namib Desert, in some of the least hospitable areas in Africa, and continue to defy all expectations, living usually between 30 and 60 years until they get too big and then die off when they're invaded by grass. The oddest thing, though, at least to me, is not that they just exist, but that they're spaced out relatively well, and there's not just a few hundred and, and that's it, but there's apparently a number into the near millions. And the other odd part, if not possibly the scary part, is there might be more and more of these things going forward. Like I said before, they were seen and talked about since the 1920s in Africa, but they've also recently been found in Australia as well. This isn't shocking as both areas seem to be desolate deserts that get little to no rainfall, but scientists only seem to find these odd circles in areas that get between 70 and 120 milliliters of water annually, and even if you go up to 120 milliliters of water, these circles don't appear. Now researchers are much closer to finding out how these fairy circles live and operate than lots of other things on this list, but of the two theories, they can't get to 100% definitive proof, but boy is it close. I won't tell you which one is the theory that's more believed, and I'll leave that up to you to make your own informed decision. The first is that termite casts have been found in all of the fairy circles and they feed on the vegetation, which thins out the vegetation but allows the water to seep into the empty area of no vegetation, causing a buildup underground and the ring of grass is the living grass enjoying the bountiful water. The other theory is that the grasses compete for natural resources of water and work together to weed out, sorry, other competitors for water in the middle of the fairy circle, allowing grasses along the edge to flourish and use the empty space as a small reservoir. But while we're getting closer to finding out the truth about these cool circles in the desert, I have had enough of random circles appearing without knowledge of how or why they exist. And don't even get me started on fairy rings. Fairy rings. <laughs> Fairy rings are circles of mushrooms that grow- I'm just kidding. This is a fairy ring. This is a fairy ring in RuneScape. It's also not on the iceberg. I just wanted to show off that people think that fairy rings are evil, and that you have to be saved from them, while also that they're magical and fairies of course live in them. But speaking of circles of mysterious origin, Potomsky Crater. Man, I'm good at segues. The Potomsky Crater is a giant rock formation of shattered limestone located in Siberia that is roughly 520 feet across and 130 feet tall. The crater was initially found by a geologist in 1949 and has been puzzling researchers, geologists, and people on YouTube like me for many years. To this day, nobody has ever really been able to figure out what caused this to appear. While on the voyage to discover this crater, Vadim Kolpakov, 
the geologist who discovered it, was warned by locals to not go up and investigate up close, as anybody who had stepped into the crater would die. He did anyway, and was perfectly fine, hence why we know about it today. But in 2005, another person who went on the expedition did indeed die of a heart attack shortly after visiting the crater, so maybe the legend is true. Kolpakov came up with the first theory as to how the crater came to be, which was a meteorite. And while still a leading theory, many others have come and gone since. There's always the supernatural or otherworldly, which for this is that it was aliens. Yes, that cut and dry. While some other modern theories include an eruption of underground gas, volcanic explosions, and in 2006 a conference was held in which the attendees attempted to reason and figure out what really caused this crater. The attendees, while there, came up with the leading theory of the time, which is that it was believed to have been formed by geological process within the system with the help of gas and silicate. While this was of course the leading theory at the conference, many others are quick to point towards meteoric origins. And while we just may never know until the tools we have at our disposal improve to find out, all we know is that it's really cool looking, and that it appeared roughly 300 years ago. And until we get a definitive answer, people will speculate and come up with many reasons as to its origins. Impossible Colors Impossible Colors are what started this whole video and concept of this video until it became the largest video I've made to date. Impossible colors are colors that don't appear in normal everyday life, or colors that humans can't see visually. And while we may know that these colors should theoretically exist, or that we can try and quote, recreate them, there's still something about humans not being able to see or process something as simple as color. This may seem weird as how are we supposed to see colors we can't see? That doesn't make sense. And that means that we're about halfway down this iceberg and why it has taken so long to make. <laughs> The human eye can see up to 10 million different colors, and while that might seem like a lot, there are very high ranges of colors that if we could see them, would exponentially increase the number as the wilder we went. I am again, not a scientist, nor am I an eye doctor, but humans see color with what are called cones and rods. These cones and rods interpret light that reflect off materials which make specific light waves reflect and hit off of, and are interpreted as color in our brains as the colors we see today. One facet, yes there are multiple of impossible colors is that our cones and rods, and in turn eyes and brains, can't reach the levels needed to interpret and understand impossible colors because they're limited. Our eyes see the curve of these wavelengths and that interprets the colors to get what we can see. But the wavelengths that we can see overlap and therefore can't reach the full potential of the color spectrum that is just beyond the grasp of our eyes. If the wavelengths didn't overlap and only were able to excite one cone, our eye could find other colors that don't exist. This is where some impossible colors live. For example, the easiest to find impossible color would be hyper green, where the color green is mostly in the middle wavelength of color. And if the cones in our eyes could see more of that medium cone, we could see a green that no one has ever seen. There are of course other colors that would fall in this area, but that's just one example. The other examples are what I like to call opposite colors. Opposite colors are a little more easy to explain. They're as simple as colors that, under normal circumstances, cannot be mixed like red-green or yellow-blue. They're impossible to mix as the brain has mechanisms in place to fight the mixing of these colors on the cortex level apparently. Who knew? Scientists have set up experiments to try and get the human eye to meld these colors together, and have to great result. But the human brain just can't comprehend it. With artists, every men and every woman describing it as anything from a quote, field of color, to dots intermingling, or an island of the color that they only could remember but for a moment. And lastly, the easiest to understand and by proxy explain are what called chimerical colors, which are colors that our eyes can't see, but our brain can. The three main examples on this helpful little diagram right here, they are Stygian blue, best experienced by either staring at yellow for an extended period of time, which will make your eyes perceive a dark blue after image, and then looking at black, therefore making a color darker than black. The effect can also be experienced by staring at a light, not for too long please, as that's bad for your eyes, and then closing them. The afterimage that you can see when your eyes are closed is a form of Stygian blue. Self-luminous red is the best experience of the inverse way of staring at green for a long time, which causes an afterimage of red to appear. And when you stare at something white, it gives the result of something brighter than white, while simultaneously red. Very weird. And finally, hyperbolic colors are kind of the intermingling of these two, where if you were to stare at bright cyan, it would give the afterimage of orange. So if you were then to stare at an orange background, you would experience a version of orange that was more than 100% orange. If you want to try any of these for yourself, go ahead. If you need to pause the video on this little chart I found, go right ahead. I'll be right here when you get back. In the meantime though, the rest of us will be going another layer deeper on this iceberg, as we continue to find weirder and weirder, less comprehensible things deeper below the waves. 
deeper below the waves. Skyquakes. Skyquake is not the Transformers toy. Let's get that across right now. I will use the Transformer toy as a stand and visually, but they're not the same thing. Skyquakes are actually loud booms in the sky that have no apparent cause. They have been reported and heard across the globe, and sound like things as loud as cannon fire, artillery, and loud thunder. They have many different names, and have been reported as early as the early 1800s all across the globe. So while Skyquake is a common term in the English language, you might have heard them called something different depending on where you grew up. One of the latest occurrences happened in 2017, when in Alabama a Skyquake rocked the region and made such a mess that it caused many to call 911 out of fear something bad had happened. There is no apparent cause or even a leading hypothesis about what causes these Skyquakes to really happen. Many say that it's small earthquakes underground that don't actually shake the ground but just make a very loud sound. And people on the other side say it's meteors penetrating the upper atmosphere that cause sonic waves to ripple out, but would allow the meteors to burn up upon entry. And of course, there's the theory that it's aliens, with ships and beings we can't see which would allow them to make noise without leaving a trace. That goes into theory that it's all military testing, and it's actually the work of a long speculated but never proven aircraft that aircraft bucks have dubbed Aurora. Whatever it is, or whatever your theory on it is, don't worry, there's plenty left to speculate. Hey, so originally there was supposed to be a section on the mathematical summation right here. That if you add every single number ever together, you get negative 1 over 12 instead of infinity. I didn't expect this out of everything in this entire video to be the main thing people got upset about, but hey, here we are. I got comments on both sides, some defending the Ramanujan summation and some disproving it, and lots of people coming both to my defense and also lashing out in the comments to part two against others. So I'm removing this section as I said I would, and I won't be covering any mathematical concepts going forward if I can help it, as that's very clearly for someone else to cover. If you want to do your own research and look up the Ramanujan summation and negative 1 over 12 and everything involved with that, and come to your own conclusions, you absolutely can. As for the next topic, it's also math related. But as I put in big words at the bottom of the screen originally, the next concept was supposed to be a form of foreshadowing for stuff later into the video than anything else. Why don't I just let you watch? Imaginary numbers. Probably forgot about these after high school, but imaginary numbers are real numbers that equate to a negative square. That doesn't make sense to me. Like I said, I'm not a mathematician, but they're very important. Imaginary numbers are technically understandable, but impossible to comprehend at the same time. This little fancy I right here is what you'll see when we're talking about these. And let me reiterate, again, not a mathematician. But until recently, I always got tripped up on imaginary numbers, and I wanted to talk about them because imaginary numbers really help me understand stuff towards the bottom of this iceberg. Imaginary numbers are used a lot more than people might think, and are extremely important in determining and helping understand systems in electricity, as well as, of course, math. But I like electricity more. They help quantify and fill out areas where we know there's something, but we can't determine or figure out exactly what those things are. So we need a placeholder. The easiest way I've heard it described is kind of like the number zero. We'll get to zero later, but there was a time before we even had the number zero, if you want to think about it. That makes sense. Something to describe nothing or a placeholder. Before then, we would just put in spaces. It's an idea that really doesn't have many cases until you need a case for it. So we use I and put it in places where we know we need to determine calculations or have to be ready for a variable where the answer is essentially unknown. And that, even though a very odd way of putting it, is what I think a lot of ideas boil down to, knowing a lot of parts of the formula while not knowing specific individual aspects and having to work around them. The first stage of memory loss. This, along with imaginary colors, were among the two main topics I knew about going into this video that we as humans just can't comprehend or solve. As someone who has had a family member personally affected by memory loss, like many others, it's a very hard journey for the people around them to go through. And the truth is that as of now, we don't actually know the distinction of the first stage of Alzheimer's. That's a very tricky topic and subject to nail down, as the concept itself, timing, stage, and more are almost entirely impossible to nail down. We know that there are seven stages to the global deterioration scale, from stage one of no cognitive decline or no memory loss, where most people are, to stage seven of very severe cognitive decline and late stage dementia. And each stage is usually marked and noted with specific characterizations and symptoms that help the affected person along the way, as well as their caregivers give them the best life going forward. It's extremely hard to calculate and figure out if forgetting keys or forgetting people's names is a sign of everyday forgetfulness or something serious after all. And that's why this topic is so hard. While technically the second stage of deterioration, 
This stage is unknown about the expected length, when symptoms usually start or if they can be slow to this stage. At this early stage, it's also very easily confused and mixed with normal age-related cognitive decline. And as of now, there are virtually no clinical tests that may remain undetectable for quite a while going forward. In the meantime, though, there are plenty of ways to help slow down cognitive decline, like a healthy diet, good sleep habits, reducing stress, and challenging your brain. And one of the ways you can challenge your brain is today's spon- No, I don't have a sponsor. That's, that's a joke. This is an actual call to be sure and try and reduce stress in your life. As well as stay hydrated, eat a healthy diet, and have a good day, alright? That last one was for me, not a sponsor. But still, I mean it. I hope you're having a great day, and let's move on to the next level of this iceberg, why don't we? Delving below the waves. The WOW signal. The WOW signal was a radio signal detected on August 15th, 1977, by the Ohio State University's Big Ear Radio Telescope. The telescope detected a very odd anomaly that was circled and the word WOW was written next to it, in which you were looking at right now that led to the anomaly's name. The signal, which some say is a cleverly encoded message, is actually a variation of a signal's intensity over time, with the WOW signal reaching at its peak in intensity between 30 and 31, which is 30 times the standard detection from background noise the radio telescope was used to picking up. You can see now why people got very excited about this noise. Its space is equivalent of the bloop sound heard in the ocean. But what could it mean, or what is it exactly? It's been extremely hard to replicate for many reasons. The main one being we know roughly what area the signal was heard from, but not exactly, as the big ear operated off of two different devices, each receiving a deep beam from slightly different directions. And only on one of the devices, the wow signal was detected, and the way it was detected intermingled the data, so we have two different areas in which the signal may have come from. So doubling up on searching in that area, and attempting to try and find where the signal is, has made the process take a bit longer. With all this attention though, they really started honing in on what were in these areas, finding multiple stars and even a few sun-like stars. This of course adds to the likelihood of possible extraterrestrial connection to these areas, but so far, no techno-signature candidates have been observed in this area. Without me researching, I wouldn't know what that means, but it basically means the radio detection has not been replicated pointed at the same spot, or been observable since. This has led many to believe both that the signal was from a far-off extraterrestrial species emitting their own radio waves from some form of vessel, possibly a lighthouse-type sweeping signal, a fluke, or a hydrogen cloud having comets pass through them causing a frequency to be picked up on Earth. There are many, many different possible explanations, but none that any governing scientific body have been willing to put forward and back or that we have an explanation for, really. But, if you happen to have tweeted, by the way, even though it's dying horribly, you can still follow me on Twitter, at Gordon Sanafa. Can't get the at Gordon. A tweet that has the hashtag, hashtag chasing UFOs in 2012, the Arecibo Observatory beamed a digital stream towards the area that consisted of about 10,000 tweets, as well as videos from celebrities and a repeating header to help any would-be intelligent species know that the message was intentional. So who knows, maybe there's another intelligent life form out there that's just reading some of our tweets. Mystery eruptions. I covered this a little in my last video on the topics of vampires, oddly enough. Please go watch that video. I put a lot of effort into it and I really like the subject matter and I hope you do if you like this video. But there are eruptions on this earth that we aren't sure when they happened or to what degree they happened, but we know that they had an impact on us as people. The more recent major example was one that happened somewhere between 1808 or 1809. A few years after, in 1816 and years around then, the global temperature was oddly low on Earth, with 1816 having the lowest recorded summer temperatures ever between 1766 and 2000, which caused some real issues, especially with food. This was first believed to have been the cause of the volcanic eruption of Mount Tambora in the Dutch East Indies, and very much could have been the cause of it all. But new research into the matter has shown that there were very high sulfate spikes, as well as tree ring data that shows that the eruptions may have taken place earlier than expected, possibly as early as 1808. Another theory is that there was a large amount of these mystery eruptions that took place all over the world in areas we had no access to or were ever recorded that might have lowered the global temperature by quite a bit, leading to possibly a little ice age. Some people also believe that the large amount of eruptions might have displaced and shaken up the crust of the Earth so much as to cause and led to the eruption of Tambora in 1815, which led to the year without a summer. This, all while many other volcanoes and eruptions, have and had been recorded around the time, but none quite enough to affect the world in the way that it did, as well as in the right areas. 
Some have speculated that these mystery eruptions took place somewhere in Antarctica, as well as some place in between Indonesia and Tonga. But no one really has the ability or confirmation as to give a definitive answer, and there may never be. Infinity. Infinity is something endless, or the opposite of nothing, everything, but more. You know, it's really hard to describe infinity. You try. And that's kind of why it's on this list, because humans have an extremely hard time understanding what in math are called large numbers. Because while humans are pretty good at counting and doing math, we're not very good at comprehending very large numbers. I can count to 100. I can even probably count to 1,000 or 10,000, give it enough time. But do I really understand how many 10,000 of any given thing is? If I gave you $1,000 in ones, it might be a whole bunch of paper to deal with. But if I gave you $1,000 in pennies, the amount of pennies might be more than you or I would ever see in our combined lives. And that's where large numbers start to trip up humans. We've had many centuries, if not millennia, of living in small areas and villages with maybe a couple hundred to a thousand people. Or more recently, in cities with millions of people. But this is kind of new to humanity, though, as a whole. And there's even a term for this. Well, more a number, but you know. It's called Dunbar's number, which is the cognitive limit on the number of people that one can maintain social relationships with. And most people, including you and I, can only keep up with about 150 people before we start having a hard time maintaining or keeping people straight in our heads. But that's only 150. And this part of the iceberg isn't called Dunbar's number, it's called infinity. And while yes, 10,872,003 is a large number, technically we can determine this number exactly and correlate it to something in the real world. The amount of sand in an hourglass or pennies, right? But a number so big, that the concept of it is something nobody can ever truly grasp is something special. And yet, there are multiple types of infinities and sizes of infinities even. I want to remind you again, I am not a mathematician. <laughs> and maybe that's why these math concepts really mess with my head. But they're all wild to me and go simultaneously all the way up and all the way down. The smallest form of infinity is the fact that between any two numbers, there are infinite numbers. Little weird, but it's true. You could find infinite smaller numbers between any two whole numbers all the way to its only smaller infinity. Let me give you an example. If you had a six inch ruler and you wanted to add half the length of that ruler to the end of the first one and then half of that ruler onto that one, you would never ever hit 12 inches. That's what's called an infinite progression. That's just on the smaller side as well. Somehow people out there have found out that while there are technically infinite numbers, not all infinities are made equal. If you have an infinity made out of integers or real numbers, you technically would hit the end at some point. While if you had a form of infinity without integers and assigned integers to them instead, the second form of infinity is larger. Stuff like this is way too big brain for me. So if you want, you can watch this video on the infinite hotel paradox where much smarter people and better at 3D modeling than I am made a helpful informational video to show just how wild infinity is. But luckily, this section of the video isn't infinite. So we can just move on to cold fusion. Cold fusion, the ability to get more energy out of a nuclear exchange at room temperatures without a nuclear explosion. While this might not sound that crazy on the surface, it only really makes sense on the surface. The surface of the sun, that is. The sun has this ability, but it's also able to do this by being about 10 million degrees hotter and with 100 times the pressure than the deepest points on Earth has to offer. The concept of cold fusion and the ability to compress atoms together to create high amounts of energy has been a decade away, for many decades now. We sadly haven't had much success or even really breakthroughs in this technology, as most of the scientific community isn't even sure that it's a real thing. And that's why I'm here to talk about it. A couple of scientists named Pons and Fleischmann made the original experiment, which was a beaker of heavy water, where each oxygen molecule was bound to two deuterium atoms rather than two simple hydrogen atoms. They put a rod of palladium metal into it and hooked the other end to one side of a battery while the other terminal was linked to a coil of platinum wrapped around the inner wall of the beaker itself. With this original experiment, Pons and Fleischmann said that in doing this, the experiment produced an amount of heat that shouldn't be possible with the original energy of the battery itself. But the energy had to come from somewhere. The only explanation they could come up with was that the deuterium atoms were fusing and creating energy. There was a major problem though. As soon as these experiments were brought to the public, Government agencies frantically got teams together as quickly as they could and attempted to replicate these results as this would essentially mean creating more energy than spent in terms of nuclear, and could theoretically mean infinite renewable energy. But when multiple agencies attempted to recreate these experiments, they didn't get anything nearly as substantial and wrote off cold fusion as a hoax. 
They discredited Pons and Fleischmann to the point of calling cold fusion a myth. Everybody, but oddly, the United States Navy Office of Naval Research. They kept funding research going into cold fusion for years. But did it ever amount to anything? And that's where things get weird. Most organizations concluded that no heat or energy, or very sparingly, excess flashes of heat would arise, while others like Melvin Miles went from no heat or excess energy to reporting 30 to 50% more energy than was put in. What did Miles get for this, though? He was reprimanded, and the budget for research on cold fusion was cancelled after he had refined the formula for years. Miles became unemployable after reporting this information. His hundreds of peer-reviewed papers ended up meaning nothing, and Miles ended his career as a clerk in a storeroom, taking boxes off of shelves. This is a cautionary tale that only begets more caution. You see, Julian Schwinger was a Nobel Prize winning theoretical physicist. Schwinger, who sadly passed away from pancreatic cancer in 1994, spent his final years on Earth studying cold fusion. Schwinger, by the way, was one of the main researchers and scientists that helped nail down the theory of quantum electrodynamics, which, until many years of research by a committed team, was considered an anomaly itself, and what drove Schwinger to delve into the topic in the first place. It was an anomaly, but one that had at least been observed and could be speculated about. But in the end, he ended up spending his last years on a subject that sadly amounted to nothing more than disdain from the scientific community as a whole, with many editors and peers refusing to publish or edit any of his last eight theory papers. Such an anomaly as cold fusion, whether a fluke or a groundbreaking discovery and breakthrough, should be studied and looked into. And in 2004, there was hope. The Department of Energy in the United States released a study that admitted that maybe there was something to cold fusion, after all. Long after many of its pioneers had been shamed and even passed away. You see, those government agencies I mentioned before had reached out to leading scientific bodies which did their research, and the top three were MIT, Caltech, and the United Kingdom's Hallwell Laboratory. All three at the time reported that Pons and Fleischmann's report had no scientific basis. That is, until years later, the chief science writer of MIT at the time reviewed the paper and noticed that they had made an amendment to the paper three days before the final report, stating that there had been excess energy and heat. The chief science writer brought up these discrepancies, lodged a formal complaint, and resigned in protest. The damage had already been done, though. Those reports, all those years earlier, by all three agencies, had been presented to Congress and funding had been pulled. But now, with the Department of Energy admitting that maybe there is something to cold fusion, there is hope that maybe this mystery can finally be solved. In the years since the Department of Energy's admission that maybe there's something to cold fusion after all, reliable, incontestable evidence of nuclear reactions has been reported and shown that there's a future. The Navy has begun funding research into cold fusion again and backing it, but there's a distinct lack of the word fusion in their funding, just low energy nuclear reactions, which is a start. But there's still a long way to go until we can finally understand why this happens. If there are ways to use cold fusion to our advantage, or if it's just scraping the surface of nuclear reactions. Until then, we just have to keep our minds open to any theories out there. The Black Stain The Black Stain is a mysterious black substance that oozes from the roads in Caracas, Venezuela. Yeah, I read that right. I guess we're getting pretty deep in the iceberg, huh? Anyways, the Black Stain, or as it's called in Venezuela, La Mancha Negra, is an odd, quote, blob of thick black sludge with the consistency of chewing gum, end quote, first noticed by ground crews that had been sent in to repair the pothole-ridden area. The crews showed up and began the basic repair task of fixing up the roads, when they noticed this odd goo oozing out from the road in an area of only roughly 50 yards. They paid it no mind, as their job was to fix the potholes and repair the roads, not investigate, you know, black mystery fluid that no one has ever really experienced or come in contact with. So they did their job and went on their way. Five years later, though, the black stain now covered eight miles of the same road and has caused many accidents and even deaths. The goo is so far only found on a busy road that is the main thoroughfare between the capital city of Venezuela and its main international airport, allowing much traffic to cross and interact with the mystery substance. Locals have described driving on the black stain like, quote, driving in a Grand Prix, you've got to be careful or you'll die. Now this wouldn't be that wild of an unexplained slash unknown occurrence if not for the absurd amount of deaths that have been reportedly caused by the black stain. In the first five years after it appeared, La Mancha Negra had managed to kill 1,800 people on the eight mile stretch where it occupies. For comparison, the I-5 in California, which is considered the deadliest road in America, in the five year period between 2015 and 2019, 
only killed 584 people, roughly along the same length of highway. But what is the black stain? That's not only why it's on this iceberg list, but so low. And the answer is still unknown to this day. It sounds straight out of a horror film. Many people say that they will clean the black stain away one day and it'll be back the next. Some say that the black stain is nothing more than a buildup of oil and fluids from old and badly maintained cars that seemingly leaks onto the road and causes buildup with dust. But as locals and people around the world are quick to point out, many other places on Earth have poorly maintained cars and oil slicks and no other place has reported this black stain. On top of that, this mysterious goo comes and goes as it pleases. One day seeping out from the asphalt and causing mayhem, and the next is nowhere to be seen. It also doesn't seem to follow conventional means of flowing and filling lower gaps on flat open terrain, and instead appears in tunnels and on uphill slopes. There are plenty of conspiracy theories and ways that people have tried to explain away the black stain, but none so far have come close to a definitive answer. The Venezuelan government has paid millions of dollars to research and attempt to figure out what the black stain was and still doesn't know as the black stain has seemingly disappeared and isn't a problem to the Venezuelan government or people these days. So will we ever know what this botched black stain is? Who knows, maybe. But until then, it's time to dive one layer deeper to the bottom of this iceberg. Bottom of the iceberg. The birthday effect. The birthday effect is a statistical phenomenon that states that an individual is more likely to die on or close to their birthday. That doesn't mean to be scared or worried about passing away on your birthday but it does kind of mean to be a little bit more careful with celebrations on or around your birthday to avoid accidents. This is just a note from me. The stats point to that men tend to die on the days leading up to their birthday, and statistically women tend to die on their days shortly after their birthday. There are lots of possible reasons for this as the effect seems to show up in cultures across North America and Europe, including England, Wales, Switzerland, Ukraine, and the United States, as well as oddly in Major League Baseball players. A large-scale study of 2,745,149 Californians who died between 1969 and 1990 was conducted in which they corrected for factors like seasonality and deaths, elective surgeries, and those darn people born on February 29th. You know who you are. They concluded that there was a significant increase in deaths around one's birthday. An even larger study of 12,275,033 Swiss deaths found that the highest levels of the birthday effect on the actual birthday, with an increase of 17% chance of death on one's own day of birth. But what's the explanation for this? It has to be just statistical error or something, right? Well, lots of theories have gone into this alleged effect, and explanations range wildly, from misinputs on death certificates to psychological stress around the mortality of one's life around their birthday. But in most studies, these numbers and variables are taken into account. On most birth certificates and death certificates, if the day of birth or death couldn't be ascertained exactly, if both these numbers happen to fall in the same month, that would take into account these oddities. But no. As the birthday effect has been shown to be prevalent in the days before and the days after one's birthday as well, so the dates don't line up. There's also the possible explanation that like the circadian rhythm, humans have a yearly circannual biological rhythm that resets every year around a birthday. And those conditions cause changes in internal stress and thus increase the chance of death. There's a lot that goes into thoughts about this phenomenon. Alcohol can play a large part as people are more likely to get intoxicated and party on their birthday, which leads to more deaths and therefore unfortunate accidents. But there's a couple deeper theories and thoughts that seem to be where most people end up, but they kind of contradict each other. You see, a birthday is a day to either look back upon one's life and reflect in a positive way about what they would lose in death and try and hold on. And to others, it's a reminder about what has passed and can be a staunch reminder that the glory days are over. And for those that might be suffering through depression or even a terminal illness, a birthday is a fixed date for someone to focus on and allows people to try and hold on until that specific date. In the end though, we may not know exactly what the cause of this birthday effect is, or if it happens to be a statistical anomaly that will explain itself in the coming years. But it is something to think about even if it's just for a second. It's a very morbid thought, but this is why it's so deep on the iceberg, and boy it only gets deeper from here. 96% of the universe. <laughs> Jeez. Did you know that we as humans can only comprehend 4% of the known universe? The other 96% of reality is a dark matter and dark energy. That's what really got me into making this video at a deep level. I haven't mentioned it much, but so many aspects and things for this video have come from the book 13 Things That Don't Make Sense by Michael Brooks. Which if any of these topics have intrigued you or interested you at all, you should absolutely buy this book as it was one of the most enjoyable reads I've had in a long time. Check it out, please. That being said, in that book, Brooks goes on to what I'm going to be calling the missing universe, which is the fact that of every single thing in the entire universe, humans can only comprehend 4% of it. To put that into perspective, 
We as humans have observed almost the entirety of land on Earth, with lower estimates being that we've only observed 78% of land on Earth, and to some sources as high as 98% of land, not including Antarctica, which is pretty high. But in comparison, we've only explored between 5 and 22% of the oceans on our own planet. That equates to us not knowing roughly what 65% of the planet we live on is or looks like. That's a huge percent, but pales in comparison to the fact that 96% of the entirety of everything might actually be unobservable and impossible for humans to even recognize or perceive. It may be a matter of perception, it may be a matter of science and math making it extremely hard to detect it. But how do you plan or even begin to go about detecting something that simultaneously exists and doesn't exist? It's wild, but there are people on this earth whose sole jobs are to try and observe that dark matter and dark energy are even real. Because we know that something is out there, but we just don't know what. Well, with dark matter itself, it's pretty possible that we could detect it in some form, right? Like something has to interact with dark matter. And that's kind of where we are right now. There are scientists and researchers doing extremely elaborate experiments to even prove the existence of this stuff. Because without it, so many things in the universe remain undiscovered and confusing. There are laboratories and facilities as deep as 1100 meters in the UK, and 700 meters in the United States full of materials at temperatures as close as humanly possible to absolute zero, just to hope that one form of dark matter will collide and hit one of these detectors on Earth. And that's just dark matter. Dark energy is the bigger, badder brother of dark matter. You see, while dark matter is a form of matter that does impossible things like possibly holding the entirety of our solar system together, to attracting gravitational force and holding the galaxy in place. Dark energy is the opposite. Dark energy is everything that pushes against the folds of time and space. Breaking laws, going against all forms of known gravity, and as far as we can tell is just getting bigger and bigger and making the universe as a whole large at a rate that we can't figure out. The universe was proven to not just be expanding still, but the expansion is accelerating. The cosmos are literally blowing themselves apart. From looking at and observing supernova, and even taking into account space dust and the time it takes for energy to get back to us on Earth, the results show that the universe has a negative amount of mass, which makes absolutely no sense by the way. All things that make up dark matter and dark energy go against what we know to be true and right on Earth, so much that there's a whole other form of theoretical and quantum physics and mechanics that the rules we've developed for things like gravity on Earth and in our solar system don't seem to work. There's things like quantum entanglement that just goes against every single thing that you could even think of making sense. So much that Einstein, yes, that guy, called it spooky action at a distance. There is so much to space and physics, and I'm all here for it. But when there's an entire 96% of everything that we don't know, it really gets to me. What is it? Have we been thinking of it all wrong and possibly the entirety of everything is wrong? And have we been throwing a god particle or two at the whiteboard and hoping something sticks? I don't know. I'm some person on YouTube that doesn't have anything close to a degree in the sciences. We just have to go and wait. Like so many other things on this list, and probably many other things that I haven't covered, there are things out there that are so hard to even begin to understand and wrap our minds around, to think of theoretical and even galaxy-wide phenomenon in our day and age. What's to come in the future? We could have an answer to dark matter, and dark energy, and what our entire universe is made up of at the end of the day. It may be something intensely wild and sciencey, or it may be something cosmic and horrifying. And I'm all here for it, and I hope you are too. But before I ramble on any more about cosmic sized proportions and wild out there concept like gravity, oh, that's the next topic, okay. Well, let's, uh, let, let's talk about how gravity is wrong. While not proven, and kind of like how 96% of the universe is unknown, it adds to the air of mystery that things people thought so concrete as fundamental laws can be uprooted and changed just one day. There's a growing group of people on Earth and scientists that believe that the formula and our understanding of gravity is wrong. These scientists believe that Newton's law of gravity is wrong, but can't prove it, as proving it would fundamentally change your understanding of physics and gravity itself, but would possibly allow for the concepts of dark matter and dark energy to be understood or at least quantified. If there is dark matter and dark energy at all. You see, that's why I put these topics right next to each other on this iceberg, as I had no idea that these are kind of connected. There are of course people out there that say theories and ideas about how gravity is just wrong entirely, but as many memes have let me know, things that go up must come down. And to think that many people, much smarter than I, have had to seriously sit down and come to grips with that fact, and even debate how things come down is quite funny to me. But in reality, there are weirder elements of gravity not making sense, that most respected scientists believe that the formula just needs tweaking, but in doing so that would uproot what it's all built on. 
Newton's Law of Gravity. Some of these more recent scientists like Mordhai Milgram, Stacy McGaw, Jacob Beckenstein, and David Rubin have created a whole new model for gravity called MOND, M-O-N-D, that entirely changes the way that gravity is calculated and gets rid of these mysterious particles like dark matter and dark energy in a more straightforward way. But they haven't been given the light of day by modern scientists, as they already have a very well accepted and tested model of gravity with Newton's law, and don't want to change 400 years of gravity and mess with Newton at all, even though he's dead. Really wouldn't mind, I don't think. But that was until Jacob Beckenstein got involved. He made various controversial statements and proposals about black holes back in the day, which turned out to be true, by the way, and decided to take a crack at Mond. And the scientific world had to take it seriously at that point. But that caused some problems, when on August 21st, 2006, NASA made a press release titled, NASA Finds Direct Proof of Dark Matter. See, this is why I'm a YouTuber, I hid this right here. The information was about the observation of a massive collision between two clusters of galaxies known as the Bullet Cluster. They observed that dark matter had separated from normal matter during the collision. They had this observation by looking at the way light bent around an area of seemingly empty space, with the knowledge that any radiation traveling through space would follow a curved path if it interacts with any matter in the vicinity. So when light bent around seemingly nothing, it was seemingly definitive proof of dark matter. That's how strongly people were looking and trying to find any proof of dark matter, by the way. A bend of light across the galaxy. So we can finally say that we have proof of dark matter, right? So I don't know why I included that other section. Well, no. In the same article, NASA says that this is the strongest evidence yet that most of the matter in the universe is dark. They went on to say essentially that anyone that doesn't believe in dark matter has no ground to sit on, as no one can possibly explain the observed effects of this collision any other way. Meanwhile, the people of Mond had already put out a peer-reviewed paper two months earlier, and in my personal opinion, a very funnily titled paper, Can Mond Take a Bullet?, in a well-respected astronomy journal. The existence of the refraction in the collision didn't contradict Mond at all in their models. In the end, that's what's so hard, and why this deep into the iceberg a lot of these subjects that humans can't comprehend and try to understand end up pretty unsatisfying, with the fact that a theorem a thought, or even a person, hasn't come up with a way of figuring it out yet. Or even if they have, the rest of the scientific community, or even the world, may be against them. All we can hope is that someday we may be able to figure out the truth of dark matter, dark energy, and even figure out more about gravity. Until then, though, we have Fourth Dimension and Beyond. Oh boy. <laughs> if I thought explaining concepts that are hard for people to understand was hard before, this is where things get worse. <laughs> Humans can experience and see, feel, and observe things in three dimensions. And there are technically different dimensions and different interpretations of the fourth dimension and beyond. You see, if you draw a line, that's a one-dimensional shape. Add that to a second dimension by adding a y-axis, you get a second dimension. Add another axis to that and you, you get a third. That's a whole third dimension right there. But now the problem with this though is you can't add another axis to this three-dimensional shape without it looking very weird. And there are interpretations of four-dimensional shapes. Here, here's one on screen right now. But it's not possible in our given world. Adding an additional axis to these shapes causes them to bend reality as we know it. And yet we can still see and comprehend it in 2D space on a screen or an interpretation of it in 3D space. So how do we know it's real? Well, I just showed it to you, so there's that. But people have created tesseracts and other objects and models that recreate what four-dimensional space would be like. So that's not hard for humans to comprehend, right? Like, you're looking at it right now. And the answer is still yes. But there are theoretical fourth, fifth, all the way up to possible ten different dimensions that humans can't comprehend. Past, length, width, and height. And if you're smart, you can include time as well. As with the first three dimensions, you can pinpoint an object's location in space, and with time as well, you can find its exact location anywhere. See, this is where the other spin on the fourth dimension comes in. But we can't really see time, can we? No, not technically. You can perceive clocks and even keep time. I almost included a whole additional subject to this video, by the way, about how clocks on different levels of buildings run at different speeds, and clocks in planes going different directions also operate at different speeds, but I didn't, so you get to hear me mention it here instead. So time is incredibly hard to perceive as a dimension, as it's kind of weird. But with the dimensions of length, width, height, and time, or longitude, latitude, and altitude, you can pinpoint the exact location of any given object in the entire universe. But didn't I say there are 10? Well, yes. But those are for bigger-brained individuals. The three-dimensional space that we can perceive is more than enough for the average person, and time is even better. 
But according to string theorists, there are 10 different dimensions that include and take into account time, and even other universes and worlds. This is about to get wild, by the way. You see, the fourth dimension is time, like I've already mentioned, like probably five times. But being able to actually interpret and see time itself through things like general relativity as well as quantum mechanics would open the doors into the higher dimensions. String theorists believe that if we could see into the fifth dimension, we could see a world slightly different from ours, and be able to interpret and measure similar things between our worlds and others and use that information to help us see into the sixth dimension. If we could see into the sixth dimension, we could see a plane of all possible worlds and possible universes. The closer ones in the sixth dimension would be universes and worlds that started with similar trajectories. It would allow us to see into the past as well as into the future through the possible universes. I would go on and on, but essentially by the time we hit the tenth dimension, we hit the limits of what humans can even possibly comprehend if we could see that deep, which is everything and nothing at the same time. Every possible timeline, every possible start, every possible end, and every single thing in between. There's a reason I believe as to why we can't see or interpret all these levels of the different dimensions, as it would drive people wild and mad just understanding and seeing this information, let alone being able to comprehend possible beginnings of universes and beyond. But that's luckily not a worry for me or you on this video, as we seem to have gotten to the bottom of the iceberg finally. We're done. Wait, wait, why is there still time left in the video? There's nothing deeper than this that we could... Are you telling me that there are even deeper levels to this iceberg? Okay, I, I guess there is just one last level. But before we get into this next section, I want to say thank you all again for watching this long, and I want to encourage you to go to putinyoursocialsecurity.com. It's not a scam, I swear. No, really, it's not. It may just entirely seem like a scam, but I swear. It's a helpful little way of getting to my new Patreon page where you can help support the channel personally. I currently do all of this editing, writing, researching, and everything while still working my full-time job. And I want to offer a way for anyone that wants to personally help support these types of videos to continue to be made and also get your name in the credits of every video as well. You can also participate in polls as well and help vote on which videos you would like to see next. Any and all help will go straight into making these videos better, as well as hopefully help me get a more consistent schedule and upload more often. But let me just be real, this video took ages to make and covered topics I was not prepared to research beforehand. You have no idea. So thank you again so much for getting to this point in the video, and now I guess we'll get to the very bottom of this iceberg, or as I like to call it, below the iceberg. Life. Life is extremely hard to define. As scientists even have a hard time classifying what exactly is life at the simplest of levels. Life to some might be as simple as classifying when a system reproduces. But there are plenty of men, people, and women, nuns, and sterile people that can't reproduce. While computer systems could classify as living if that were the case. So is it a system that can move around, create waste, and consume fuel? If so, then cars classify as alive. You see why this is a little hard to classify? Most definitions include other objects that don't live, and vice versa. Physicist Paul Davies attempts to classify what is life in his book, The Fifth Miracle. He lists attributes of what some constitute as life and why they don't work. In his work, he states, quote, a living being metabolizes, processing chemicals to gain itself energy. But so does Jupiter's great red eye. It reproduces itself, but mules don't. And bushfires and crystals do. Life is organized complexity, which means it is to be composed of interdependent complex systems such as arteries and legs. In this way, it's rather like a modern car. It grows and develops like rust does. It contains information and passes information on like a computer virus. Life also shows a combination of permanence and change, evolving and growing through mutation and experience. And for Davies, living beings are autonomous. They determine their own actions, to some trying to define life itself is seen as damaging of determining what life itself is. A 2007 editorial in the journal Nature said the following in regards to life. One might have hopes that such perceptions of a need for a qualitative difference between inert and living matter, such vitality, would have been interred alongside the pre-Darwinism belief that organisms are generated spontaneously from decaying matter. That is the nerdiest sentence I think I've ever read. Scientists who regard themselves as well beyond such beliefs, nevertheless bolster them when they attempt to draw up criteria for what constitutes life." End quote. 
This was written in regards to synthetic biology and the achievements that were being made at the time to build life from chemical components. Uh, some of the advancements of the time were being held back and still are to a degree. Because just qualifying life and putting it in a box was limiting the researchers in what their end goal was and is. Because nowadays we have things like AI. Is AI alive? That's for you, the watcher, to decide. And there's no concrete answer yet. But without classifying life, can we create it? The short answer is yes. Humans and other living creatures do every day. And I want to put this out there. I don't know what I believe in terms of the creation of life and what all it entails. But Nobel Prize winning Flemish biologist Christian de Duve said it best. Life is either a reproducible, almost commonplace manifestation of matter, given certain conditions, or a miracle. Too many steps are involved to allow for something in between. And I genuinely do think that puts it all into perspective. We've done experiments and put all the parts needed to create life in a flask. Hit it with electricity and the building blocks of life begin to show up. But it hasn't made life. We've created and gotten excessively close to creating machines that could soon be classified as living. But those were created from parts and systems that aren't really alive quite yet. I'm not here to lecture you or tell you what to think in terms of how life came to be through either some deity or primordial sea. But I will say that you are something special, as there's nothing like you out there right now. And either way, every single action and reaction in the entire universe has led up to you existing right now. You're astounding. I want you to remember that, okay? Now that I've cheered you up a little and made you feel a little bit better about your life, let's talk about death. <laughs> Death is whenever something ceases to exist and dies, and is a fundamental part of life. And yet there are things on Earth that don't. And better yet, we may one day soon experience a time when humans don't need to die. For example, Blanding's turtle is an enigma that I don't think is mentioned enough. You see, Blanding's turtles don't stop producing eggs as they age. And not only that, they seem to lay more eggs as they get older. This essentially goes against everything we know about animals reaching their reproductive stage and aging as a whole. This goes against what we call senescence, or the deterioration over time of a cell's power to divide and grow. And that's been the standard theory of life itself for a very long time now. But it seems like scientists these days are finding more and more examples of not just turtles that seem not to age, but fish, amphibians, and reptiles as well. You see, scientists don't technically know if dying naturally is necessary. Most are quick to point out that if nothing died, the whole world would be very full of very old people. An overpopulation would be a horrible reality, while also pointing out that subsequent generations would be stronger and more fit, so survival of the older generations would be harder. So maybe death is a natural way of keeping populations down, right? The individual dies so the species can continue. At least that's what 19th century German biologist August Wiesmann put forth. Maybe. Once a human being had reproduced, the body would stop putting effort into repairing itself, thus allowing the individual to die off. But this goes against the evolutionary model, as evolution selects genes to benefit individuals and their offspring, not to benefit the group or species. So if this death gene is necessary, then evolution doesn't work. And if evolution works as intended, this group selection doesn't. This is why so much of this is hard to come to a conclusion with. If one thing is true, it throws off everything else. Many scientists have come up with other explanations with reasonings like genes having kill switches and a generic program for aging, but none quite like Cynthia Kenyon, who was able to double, if not triple the life of nematode worms who normally live two to three weeks to a whopping six weeks. All she had to do was stop giving the worms any sugar at all. Kenyon went on to, and continues not to, have any sugar or carbs in her own diet in hopes that this is possibly the key to extending one's own life. So if that's all there is to double, if not triple life, why don't we do it? Well, testing on humans is hard, as we know, and testing long-term on humans is even harder, especially something as specific as diet. But if we know that not eating sugar could possibly end aging, why doesn't everybody just not eat sugar? Well, it's yummy. Uh, but besides that fact, a man named Leonard Hayflick found something that threw a wrench into this whole possible kill switch gene theory, replicative senescence. It all begins with a woman named Henrietta Lacks, who sadly contradicted cervical cancer and gave the world quite possibly the most unique, useful, and in my own eyes, wild gift. Her cancer cells. She had a biopsy that gave researchers, doctors, and scientists, quote, the most robust and fastest growing cells scientists had ever seen. Sadly, Henrietta died from her cancer the day the announcement on these cells were made. 
but this legacy is wild. Just follow me on this for one second, please. The Gila line of cells ended up helping find the polio vaccine. They were placed at atomic bomb test sites and even ended up on the space shuttle. And these are just the beginning. This line of cells has been extremely important in finding the connection between senescence, cellular immortality, and the formation of tumors. You see, at the same time as the Gila line of cells were discovered, our old friend Hayflick just so happened to stumble across the fact that normal healthy cells couldn't be recultivated more than 50 or so times. The cultures would double for 10 months or so and then suddenly die. He repeated this and even sent samples to other scientists and gave them a date they would expect to die off. And they did. You see, we technically know how to keep cells alive forever, thanks to research and help from the old HeLa cells. They can put an enzyme called telomerase into human cells and they lived theoretically forever in a petri dish. But that leads to cancer. So not necessarily a good thing or a discovery we could live with. So what does that leave us? Well, kind of right back where we started from. Both theories of a genetic kill switch and replicative senescence have legs, but both have evidence that contradicts both as well. Scientists began to breed what they called, quote, long-lived fruit flies in an attempt to prove the kill switch gene theory. And it worked in the beginning. Long lives seemingly came at the expense of fertility and reproduction. But then, as the lives of the fruit flies got longer, the fertility began to rise above the normal of the control group, essentially disproving their own theory of a kill switch gene, at least in fruit flies. In other animals, they were able to remove genes from nematodes that removed the worm's reproductive system and they lived four times longer. So the kill switch would never enact, but their lives lengthened, not shortened. Then there's the mortality plateau that doesn't fit with any theory and has stumped scientists for decades. If you take a population of fruit flies, the percentage that die per day only increases with their age until a certain point. After that, the fraction that die per day stays flat. The closest full theory that we've even gotten recently is that possibly aging might have evolved for its own sake. Species dying specifically to make room for the younger generation. It goes against everything. Cast a shadow on evolution, natural selection, and aging as a whole. But science as a whole seems to not care. Most camps are more preoccupied with either disproving their quote competitors and the understanding of death itself, or are too busy trying to sell something. So in the end, where does that leave death? It's still there. Scientifically, we don't have an answer for it yet, aside from that cells stop splitting and dying after enough time. And unless we make some major breakthroughs, that might just be where we are for a while. The last thing I'll say in this subject is that I did not expect it to be so sciencey, but I'd rather talk about how science doesn't know why we die and not what happens when we die. Nope, not gonna cover this one, nah. Everyone has their own beliefs and thoughts on this and I don't want to explain basically why religion was made in the first place or upset anybody. I'm good. I would never do this topic justice. I don't think anyone would, aside from someone like my partner Lexi, who has a degree in religion and philosophy, so if you have any questions about religion, you can direct those to her. If you're to ask science what happens when you die, I'm fairly certain that most, like, hard sciences would say that there's not a concept of a soul. Uh, I can't be certain on that, but they, they focus on the physical. So when your body decays, when your brain activity stops, whatever that might be, they're like, okay, you're, you're done. done. That's basically that you're it. But depending on what someone's belief is about the concept of a soul, so depending on how you define that, there's a lot of philosophy on that as well, but um, if you believe in a soul, then your physical body, yes, is decaying, your physical body has died, but your soul, whatever that means to you or to that specific group of people, in a metaphysical sense, might continue on to an afterlife, might be reincarnated. Um, some people believe you become a ghost, you can become an angel to some people, so it gets really difficult and Basically what happens when you die is the vast majority of people, whether they have religious or spiritual beliefs about soul, would probably all agree that your physical body does die or decays in, in some way. Um, and then what happens after that is really left up to interpretation. Um, yeah. That's very hard to understand. Thank you. Don't send me hate, please. That was Lexi. 
again, she very much helps with all this. And again, thank you very much, honey, for that explanation of stuff that it's, you have much more experience on. But now, we're just going to move on to nothing. Nothing is a concept, yet a thing. It is the complete absence of anything, which in turn makes it something. Nothing has troubled everybody from scientists to philosophers to mathematicians. For example, the number zero wasn't always a thing. I've mentioned this earlier in the iceberg, but I'll bring it up again. Think about that for a moment, though. A number or object to denote nothing kind of contradicts nothingness as a whole. For many years, people in the Fertile Crescent used spaces and empty areas to denote when a zero would be used. But we didn't see an example of them until about the third century. It's something we take for granted now. But humans can't really understand nothing, can we? Have you ever seen nothing? No, because if you did, it would be something. Can you experience nothing? Well, to a degree, yes, but it's not recommended. There's a thing called anhedonia, which is the quote, squeezing of neural pathways in the reward center of the brain, which reduces the flow of good feeling neurotransmitters, which in turn makes everything feel less and less and less, until you have what some describe as feeling nothing when doing everything from picking up your own child to picking up a napkin and feeling the exact same thing. It's not good. I wouldn't recommend it. That's only on the mental side, though. Can one really feel nothing? You can try sensory deprivation tanks or similar sensations, in which most of your senses are turned off and can provide a way for you to experience a form of nothing. No sound, no light, no touch, no smell. But it's still not nothing, right? As you're still in a tank of salt water, you can probably smell the smell of salt. The closest that I've heard that you can easily understand what nothing is, is as simple as closing one eye lightly for a while. Go ahead, do it. Close only one of your eyes and leave the other open. Your eye that's left open still functions just as well, and even for a moment kind of helps you realize what's around you and makes up for the other eye being closed. But the other eye is still there. It's just doing nothing, essentially. It's technically still attempting to transmit information, but your brain is doing its job and is constantly suppressing the signal from the closed eye, essentially making it do nothing. But the second you open your closed eye back up, your brain gets back to work and it's back to doing its job. But in those moments when your eye is closed, your vision doesn't shift wildly. Something that was there one second no longer is. This of course isn't a pure fear of nothingness, as your eye is still there, and you're still feeling things, seeing them, and your eye's still there of course. But you don't know what's on that other side. In that brief moment, it's as though nothing's there. So now that we have a very small understanding of nothing, let me freak you out for just one moment. 99.9999999% of you and I, and every single thing that we interact with in what is in the universe, is made of nothing. It's all empty space. Every atom that binds our universe together is mostly space, and if we were able to get rid of all the empty space of every single human being on Earth and only have what is actually something, the entire human population would fit in a sugar cube. Now, it wouldn't be the weight of a sugar cube, let me make that very clear. That sugar cube made of everyone would be a few billion tons. But in terms of space, that's how much empty space we're all made of. But we can't see, feel, or even experience all that empty space, and why is that? Well, the answer is energy. In recent years, with help with the Large Hadron Collider, we've been able to figure out more about atoms and tiny physics than ever before. And we've been on the path of huge discoveries, such as that the way we understand electrons is changing that, like right before our eyes. We know now that electrons don't have a singular presence. They're oddly both a particle and a wave simultaneously, depending on how they're observed. They are never in a single location at a single moment and instead exist in several moments at the same time, and not just for electrons. All the building blocks of atoms and quarks and tiny particles are being found to exist in multiple places at the same moment. We're beginning to get into a new realm of understanding particle physics and everything that it means at the micro level. And yet some scientists are beginning to say that reality itself only exists because human consciousness wills it to exist, by interacting with the energy that makes up the universe. So what is nothing, if we can't ever know what it is? Well, it's nothing to worry about. As unless you start comprehending man-made horrors or otherwise beyond your comprehension, I don't believe we'll have to worry about nothing really. So there's a positive in this whole nothingness. And finally, comprehension. I think comprehension is a very fitting ending subject to this iceberg. 
As Albert Einstein put it so concisely, the most incomprehensible thing about the world is that it's comprehensible at all. I could end the video right there. If one of the smartest minds in the world can't even uncomprehend comprehension, how am I going to do it justice? But I think it's more that I'll just add to this ending statement. To think that for thousands of years, humans sat around and hunted and gathered, grew food and gathered in little groups. To now we have the ability to not just sit and ponder on topics as wild as the expanses of space and what it's made out of, but being able to look at atoms in between them, put satellites into outer space, calculate impossible numbers and be close to creating life and artificial intelligence, all from a group that ran around after animals and hit them with big sticks. That's what's crazy and incomprehensible to me at least. That right now, while we're watching this video, well, you're watching, I'm making it, there are things that will possibly be looked back upon as archaic and juvenile in a century or so, as we do with things a century ago now. Humanity's capacity to grow and understand will constantly continue to grow and mature as time passes, and I couldn't be happier to have taken you on this journey today. I hope you learned a whole lot, as I know I did, about wild things and concepts, and I hope you came out the other side more sane than I have, to be honest. Oh god. You have no idea. This was a monumental task to put together. From collecting all the research and resources, to getting it all written down, outlined, to not having my brain melting jumping from topics like cold fusion and nuclear physics, to the concept of anything to nothing. I know I already said this, but thank you so much for watching this long if you've made it to this point. If you wouldn't mind commenting, liking, subscribing, all the YouTube stuff, hit the button even, as it- or button? Hit the bell as it helps immensely and makes me feel good to see people enjoying the content I make, and I hope you do. I know you've been waiting a long time for this, and I have too. This has been a very long project. Um, when I started this, I was basically at a couple thousand followers and subscribers, and now I'm at almost... I passed 25,000. 25,000 subscribers since the last time that, like, I looked. You guys continue to blow me away with the amount of support, likes, comments, and just people enjoying the content that I make, and I, and I can't thank you enough for that. There's a lot that goes into this, but I hope that you all see how much I care about these, and I want them to be the best videos for you guys. And I, of course, have to give a huge shout out to my partner Lexi for helping me with so much of this, and of course my entire, like, all the people that go to put in your socialsecurity.com and support me financially. Just thank you. I'm going to list off some people that have really helped make these videos possible. I have to give a very special shout out and thank you to Bok Bok Chucky, Campfire Harvest, that's my boy, Glitch Lich, I love your SSN, Junipy, Just underscore DJ, Carte, Kelly Rafferty, Lil Parsnip, not to be confused with Mr. Stinky, Lorian, Papa Scott, Quick Naps, Walrus FB, Richard Dixon, Serial Killing, Tribal Trash 18, Ty, and Vluminati. I also need to give a very, very big special thank you to Anyo Rosin, Pato, Chris OP, and Darov Singhal for giving in a tier higher than I even have. So again, I just need to thank you all again so very much, and I hope that you've enjoyed the entire iceberg. This has been real fun, but... I'm going to take a break from Iceberg, even though I've only done one. <laughs> um, the next video I want to do is on the placebo effect and just how wild and crazy that is, so please look out for that. Until then, though, thank you so much. Genuinely. I've been Gurdon, and let's blow this popsicle stand. Good night.